An International Bestseller, The Art of Thinking Clearly, by Rolf de Belli, as read by Jen Arroyo. Introduction In the fall of 2004, a European media mogul invited me to Munich to partake in what was described as an informal exchange of intellectuals. I had never considered myself an intellectual. I had studied business, which made me quite the opposite, really. But I had also written two literary novels and that, I guess, must have qualified me for such an invitation. Nassim Nicolas Taleb was sitting at the table. At that time, he was an obscure Wall Street trader with a penchant for philosophy. I was introduced to him as an authority on the English and Scottish Enlightenment particularly the philosophy of David Hume. Obviously, I had been mixed up with someone else. Stunned, I nevertheless flashed a hesitant smile around the room and let the resulting silence act as proof of my philosophical prowess. Right away, Taleb pulled over a free chair and patted the seat. I sat down. After a cursory exchange about Hume, the conversation mercifully shifted to Wall Street. We marveled at the systematic errors in decision-making CEOs and business leaders make, ourselves included. We chatted about the fact that unexpected events seem much more likely in retrospect. We chuckled about why it is that investors cannot part with their shares when they drop below acquisition price. Following the event, Taleb sent me pages from his manuscript, a gem of a book which I commented on and partly criticized. This went on to form part of his international bestseller, The Black Swan. The book catapulted Taleb into intellectual all-star league. Meanwhile, my appetite whetted. I began to devour books and articles written by cognitive and social scientists on topics such as heuristics and biases. And I also increased my email conversations with a large number of researchers and started to visit their labs. By 2009, I realized that, alongside my job as a novelist, I had become a student of social and cognitive psychology. The failure to think clearly, or what experts call a cognitive error, is a systematic deviation from logic, from optimal, rational, reasonable thought and behavior. By systematic, I mean that these are not just occasional errors in judgment, but rather routine mistakes, barriers to logic we stumble over time and again, repeating patterns through generations and through the centuries. For example, it is much more common that we overestimate our knowledge than we underestimate it. Similarly, the danger of losing something stimulates us much more than the prospect of making a similar gain. In the presence of other people, we tend to adjust our behavior to theirs, not the opposite. Anecdotes make us overlook the statistical distribution, base rate, behind it, not the other way around. The errors we make follow the same pattern over and over again, piling up in one specific, predictable corner like dirty laundry, while the other corner remains relatively clean. That is... They pile up in the overconfidence corner, not the underconfidence corner. To avoid frivolous gambles with the wealth I had accumulated over the course of my literary career, I began to put together a list of these systematic cognitive errors, complete with notes and personal anecdotes, with no intention of ever publishing them. The list was originally designed to be used by me alone. Some of these thinking errors have been known for centuries. Others have been discovered in the last few years. Some come with two or three names attached to them. I choose the terms most widely used. Soon I realized that such compilation of pitfalls was not only useful for making investing decisions but also for businesses and personal matters. Once I had prepared the list, I felt calmer and more level-headed. I began to recognize my own error sooner and was able to change course before any lasting damage was done. And, for the first time in my life, 
I was able to recognize when others might be in the thrall of these very same systematic errors. Armed with my list, I could now resist their pull, and perhaps even gain an upper hand in my dealing. I now had categories, terms, and explanations with which to ward off specter of irrationality. Since Benjamin Franklin's kite-flying days, thunder and lightning have not grown less frequent, powerful, or loud, but they have become less worrisome. This is exactly how I feel about my own irrationality now. Friends soon learned of my compendium and showed interest. This led to a weekly newspaper column in Germany, Holland, and Switzerland, countless presentations, mostly to medical doctors, investors, board members, CEOs, and government officials, and eventually to this book. Please keep in mind three things as you peruse these pages. First, the list of fallacies in this book is not complete. Undoubtedly, new ones will be discovered. Second, the majority of these errors are related to one another. This should come as no surprise. After all, all brain regions are linked. Neural projections travel from region to region in the brain. No area functions independently. Third, I'm primarily a novelist and an entrepreneur, not a social scientist. I don't have my own lab where I can conduct experiments on cognitive errors, nor do I have a staff of researchers I can dispatch to scout for behavioral errors. In writing this book, I think of myself as a translator whose job is to interpret and synthesize what I've read and learned, to put it in terms others can understand. My great respect goes to the researchers who in recent decades have uncovered these behavioral and cognitive errors. The success of this book is fundamentally a tribute to their research. I am enormously in debt to them. This is not a how-to book. You won't find seven steps to an error-free life here. Cognitive errors are far too ingrained to rid ourselves of them completely. Silencing them would require superhuman willpower, but that isn't even a worthy goal. Not all cognitive errors are toxic, and some are even necessary for leading a good life. Although this book may not hold the key to happiness, at the very least, it acts as insurance against too much self-induced happiness. Indeed. My wish is quite simple. If we could learn to recognize and evade the biggest errors in thinking in our private lives, at work, or in government, we might experience a leap of prosperity. We need no extra conning, no new ideas, no necessary gadgets, no frantic hyperactivity. All we need is less irrationality. The Art of Thinking Clearly Introduction Thank you for listening. This is Jen, your reader. See you next time.